until it gets assimilated, it's not you. It's almost you by the time it's been absorbed. It's en route. But it's got to be, it's got to get through your digestive tract at least into your lymphatic or bloodstream before we can even hope to make use of the nutrients we're consuming as food. And it's interesting because the sugars that the body uses as fuel are glucose and fructose. And the sugars in fruits are glucose and fructose. Now, almost all the other nutrients that we consume, almost all, not all, have to be digested before they can be absorbed. It's grammar school nutrition, grammar school biology. But not glucose and fructose. Glucose, you can, you can literally absorb it under your tongue. You know that little hole where water shoots out once in a while? Anybody in the room that can do that automatically on, on call? Nobody? Every once in a while somebody can. But it happens to all of us every once in a while. You actually can absorb sugar through there. If you leave the fruit in your mouth long enough rather than gulp it down, you can absorb some of the sugar straight into your bloodstream through that little hole under your tongue. When the sugars get to your stomach, they require no digestion. They're already in a readily assimilable form, glucose and fructose. They drop into your small intestine and get absorbed directly into the bloodstream without requiring digestion. This is fascinating stuff. It essentially means that while you're eating the second half of a peach, the first half of the peach, the nutrients are already in your bloodstream. That's fast. I'm actually not recommending a diet of fast food. I'm recommending a diet of instantaneous food. <laughs> What gets into your bloodstream the quickest? Air. You breathe in, it's in your bloodstream. The transfer is so fast and so effortless. It just transfers across a membrane. Oop, that's already in. It takes no time whatsoever. It's, it's amazing. It's less than a second. And then what's next? Water. You've got to have enough water for all the reasons we know. If you're not... I, Typically, athletes know, but just in case you don't know, if you don't have enough water, you can't transfer nutrients into your cells, you can't transfer waste products out of your cells, and you start to feel tired. It's going to have an adverse impact on performance, as we know in sports. You, know, uh, you wait until you're thirsty, you waited too long. I don't recommend the drink 8 to 12 glasses of water a day concept. I recommend not consuming foods that result in thirst concept. Why should I consume something that requires an antidote? Water is the antidote. If a man is dying of thirst on an island, on a desert island, he's out there dying of thirst because he can't drink the salt water, can he? What would happen if he drank the salt water? He'd get thirstier. He'd get thirstier. What would happen if he kept drinking it? Of what? Dehydration. He'd die of dehydration drinking water. But it's salt water. Which I always find a fascinating concept that people will dehydrate the salt water and then consume the salt. Now we know you can live a long time on just water. The record's 367 days. We're not going for the record, but that is the record. We can go 367 days on just water. And yet, samurais commit suicide by eating salt. Americans eat 1 50th the lethal dose of salt every day. They're, it's a slow suicide. Or not so slow. But water gets into the bloodstream inc incredibly quickly. If you're not having enough water in your system, how would you know? There's got to be a way. My whole system revolves around monitoring and objectifying monitoring and a, who lifts weights in this room? You lift weights? Do you use rubber bands or do you use real live weights? Do you, do you ever check to see what weight they are or do you just pick up the nearest ones to you? For each lift you know how much weight you can lift essentially. Like well curls are different than presses are different than still hold. Yeah you know you essentially know how much to pick up or is it always a guess? So, I mean, you know whether to pick up a 10-pound dumbbell or a 100-pound dumbbell. I mean, you have, a, you have a ballpark figure. Yeah. Okay? That's called objective 
or objectifying. You have a number that you can put to it, as opposed to subjective, where you say, oh, well, that looks like a heavy weight. I think I'll try that one. Or that looks like a light weight. I think I'll try that one. That's very subjective. It's nice to be able to put a number. Nice to be able to put a measure. Anybody here ever take their pulse? You know, you end up with a number. Oh, you don't want to say fast or slow. We end up giving it a number. All right? Temperature in the room, what time it is. We objectify things. It's nice to be able to objectify. How do you know if you have enough water in your system? Okay, if you don't pee, you prop. But that takes a while, doesn't it? The color of the pee. Color of the pee. That tells you something. What color are we looking for? Yeah, literally clear. <coughs> literally clear. It should appear clear. Yes, there is color in it, even when it appears clear. There is a little color, and it would have built up eventually. But we're looking for clear. If it doesn't appear clear, you are dehydrated to some degree. Need to add in water. How else? Color. Frequency. Medical, medical profession says if you pee less than five times in 24 hours, you are medically dehydrated. Fewer than, tw fewer than five times in 24 hours. If you pee more than 15 times in 24 hours, you probably have what they call sugar metabolic disorder of some type. And if it goes beyond 20, it's just darn inconvenient. <laughs> as well as there's probably something else going on. If we split the middle between 5 and 15 and come up with 10, this is what I'm recommending. Urination, 10 times per day in a 24-hour period. I call normal. 10 times per day. 8 to 12 if you want to range. If it goes less than 8, you should notice. Just like if you start peeing egg yolk, you should notice. If it gets down to 5, 6, 7, you go, whoa, I'm really dehydrated. I need to up, I, this, I didn't pee much in the last 24 hours. It just, it, yeah, I only peed 6 times. I need to add more water in before this becomes a problem, before it starts affecting my performance. Color, frequency, and volume. Volume. Okay. Oh, here we can be subjective. <laughs> there's two kinds of volume. There's scanty, and there's satisfactory. Okay. There's even copious, <laughs> but we shouldn't have to get there. But certainly, if it's copious, you probably held it longer than you needed to. <laughs> But there's ways to monitor. We have to watch this because because water is more likely going to be the thing that affects your performance. Before it's even sugar, before it's even minerals, water is going to be the deal. You have access to all the air you need. You have access to all the fat you need. You have access to all the protein you need. That's all been covered. Now we can start fine-tuning it. Water. If you're not getting enough water, my approach is to simply not eat foods that make me thirsty. Which foods make you thirsty? Salty. Salty foods, that's one kind. What other kind? Dried out. Dried out. Anything that's been dried out. So dehydrated foods certainly would make you thirsty. They're going to take water away from you. Normally when we think dehydrated, we think dehydrator. Who here owns a dehydrator? Okay, and who here owns a stove? Isn't that just like a really fancy dehydrator? <laughs> That's an expensive dehydrator. You put stuff in the stove, doesn't it dehydrate? Like really effectively. Okay, anything cooked, unless it's been boiled in water, is being dehydrated as it's being created. Literally all cooked food at that point becomes dehydrated.